Hi everyone. Uh, so the first speaker of this session is Suman Datta, and he'll be talking about creep response of a thermal amorphous solids. So hello everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, the amorphous solids and uh, um, thermal amorphous solids, and uh, uh, and and their how they achieve their flow uh, flow under uh, creep. So this is a work, uh, these are works in collaboration with Pinaki Choudhury from IMSC and Christian Martus from University of Grenoble Alps. And this is the world of amorphous solids, also known as the glassy materials. And they come as in different sizes, different shapes, and their properties uh, typically de uh, dependent become their length scales. So these are the metallic glasses and these are the beans, coffee beans. And you have different classes of material which show the glassy properties. And uh, so these are uh, amorphous solids, and the kind of uh, and these kind of solids they also show some flow properties, and that is why they called as the ill stress materials. So it happens when they achieve flow beyond a critical imposed stress. Uh, stress. So and this is how the flow property has been characterized. This is called the load curves, and these are the uh, flow curves. So this is what happens when you have a solid. And, you, uh, and that solid is deformed, and initially there is an elastic response, and after that there is a stress, a stress overshoot, and after that it flows. So it achieves a steady flow at the end, and this is a typical property of the ill-stress material, and that separates it from the normal solids that actually shows a large failure with a large stress drop here. And this is what happens when one actually uh, uh, put this material under some imposed stress. So if one increases the stress up to this point, there is no change in the strain rate. And after that, it deforms. And this is given by this Herschel Buckley law. And uh, this is how they deform uh, under the given stress, uh, shear stress. So th there are, uh, I, I'll be talk mostly focus on this kind of, uh, this kind of behavior. And this is a question in the nutshell. So we are interested in the jamming and jamming transition. And this is one of the very famous phase diagrams by Liu and Nagel. So this is, this, is a, this is the glass transition line. If one goes from liquid to this, this is a glass transition. Along this line, if you pack things uh, uh, more, they become jammed. And this is the yielding line. So how this typically uh, typical uh, arrested solids flow under the load, under uh, the loading. This is what the yielding is, and this is the, our central question. So this is, the, uh, this is the bulk behavior, and this is the microstructural changes that it shows. Uh, and you can see these are the, some experiments, and these are the colloidal gel at rest, and they, uh, they change a lot under uh, when they flow. So, so it brings, uh, uh, so, so again, to reemphasize our question, is to characterize both the things. One, the macroscopic uh, understanding of the flow. Also, how does the microscopic uh, changes lead to this macroscopic changes? And these are the creep. Uh, the, there are many different studies over the last few decades that actually uh, focuses on creep. So this is the, the this is the strain versus time, and you can see for when the st imposed stress is less than a particular threshold, it doesn't deform much. It, it becomes arrested. And when it crosses a particular threshold, it actually flows. So these are the very initial experiments on some thermal conditions. And this is from the group of the Thomas Whiteman. These are the experiments and simulations from the group of Egelhoff. And they also talked about, the, they, they also uh, investigated experiments, uh, the creep, via experiments and also via the simulations. And then we had this particle-based simulation model that was, uh, that was also done from our counter-site group. And they are specialized in the elastoplastic model, models. And, and, and they actually, using the mesoscale model, they also uh, modeled this creep. And what we, recently, uh, uh, what we recently figured out that, can we actually breeze this mesoscale response with the microscale response? And we did it here, and using, uh, so what we did here was by using the microscopic inputs, can we actually phenomenologically, phenomenologically form the microscopic flow behavior or not? So that we figured out here. And the kind of uh, materials that we 
we, we focus on are the glasses. So glasses are the metastable states of very long or immensely large structural time scales. So, and these metastable states can be from different material origins. So we take typical glasses of, uh, typical classes of glasses, so that are of uh, different energy lines. So these are the high, uh, these are some glasses from the very high energy states. The, these are the midline states and these are the low line states. And you can see that energetically, this one is the, is the low line glass. And also with this uh, material uh, history, it also changes their mechanical response. This is the shear modulus and uh, that actually changes with their preparation of histories. And this is what earlier was shown. So these are the quasi-static simulations and it shows that the for low line state, it shows a very large uh, stress overshoot, but it doesn't happen for the other cases. So there we don't have any prominent stress overshoot. Although the question now becomes, how does this, uh, this, this mechanical response depend on this, their material origin? So these are the, uh, these are the understanding of, of the, their mechanical behavior at the inherent structure level. So, so this quadrupolar symmetry in the stresses are present in all these glassy structures. And this was recently also shown by Shubro, Bulbul, and their group. And, uh, but we also see this quadrupolar symmetry but what is not, what we find out uh, new is that the, 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 these stress correlations actually get stronger as we explore the low line states. And, and question is, how does this stress relaxation changes, uh, uh, relaxes in, uh, under this uh, imposed loading? So these are the typical creep curves. This is for the HTL state, these are for the ESL state, these are for the GQ states. We do the molecular simulations. And in all the cases, we see that flow is achieved beyond a particular threshold. And these are the strain rates. So, so they, they, they are very uh, similar to the earlier experiments that one investigated. Now the, so this was the macroscopic behavior. Now question is, what separates this flowing state and the, and the stuck states? So we call this as the flowing state F and the non-flowing state NF. So, so we actually first go to a case where actually these stresses are infinitesimally uh, close. So only a third decimal uh, uh, change in the stress can actually separate these two cases. So there, so these are the creep curves and what we, what we are showing here are the different time points and, uh, and, and their microstructures. So these are the MSDs, local MSDs, and these are the vorticities. With, uh, as we are exploring from A to E, we can see that nothing uh, is different up to this point, C. In both the cases, the samples remain almost very similar, but here, actually, uh, there is a large change we see. Uh, we observe a very large change, and we see a slip line here, where actually the material uh, fails. And after that, there is, a, there is a large mobilization in the system, and that is why as the system goes from a blue state to a red state, they actually flows. And the other case, it is not. And what it leads to, uh, so now what drives to this kind of things, uh, this kind of changes. So the thing that uh, we also investigated on the vorticities, so these are the coarse gain vorticities and they are change, uh, spatiotemporal changes. And we can see that the, uh, the some plastic events are present up to this point, but then, there are large scale plasticity and their accumulation that actually separates these two cases. And now uh, these are the localized behavior. Uh, so, uh, so you can see these two movies. So where actually I have uh, tagged this local regions as one or zero, if it is flowing, then we call it zero. If it is not flowing, it is one. So we start with the all red state that's completely arrested. And then we see for the non-flowing case, it there remains a a solid backbone here, the percolating backbone. But in this case, that backbone is not there. We also calculated the, uh, the, the local uh, fluidization time scale, which are basically the, uh, some, something like the first process time. And we see, so we see that this percolating backbone still there at all spatial scales. So these are coarse grain maps at different scales for the non-flowing case and the flowing case. In the non-flowing case, we see that this backbone is there and there is no slip line. For the flowing case, 
we see that th there is a flowing, uh, this is the slip line, and this backbone gets dilated. Now, uh, this is the special variance of that. We call this as a dynamic susceptibility, which talks about the spatial, spatiotemporal uh, fluctuations. And it shows that this is, there, there exists a peak at all scales. So this is the first fluidization which we call that doesn't actually separate these two cases. However, the dilation of the backbones that actually separates these two cases. So this existence of this perc uh, percolation ba uh, percolating backbone was earlier there, but what was not there was whether how, uh, how, how uh, what was not there was the understanding of their role in fluidization. Yes. So now what, uh, what are the responsible factors behind these backbone dilations? So we figured out this non-Gaussian fluctuations uh, by identifying the, the plastic instabilities locally. So what do we do here? We identify the, uh, uh, the information carrying regions by identifying the, the velocities that exist beyond uh, their Gaussianity. So these are the extreme velocities or the large displacements that is happening in the system and their spatial accumulation that actually drives to this kind of flow. So, so this, is a, this is the same uh, creep curve, and this is the case, and uh, you see the movie. And for example, when it goes here, you see a large accumulation of these blue points. And now to understanding about their entropic uh, behavior, we also calculated the negentropy of, which is the, basically the non-Gaussian entropy of these fluctuations. And for this case, we see that, which is also a measure of non-Gaussianity, which earlier we, 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 we devised here. And, and, and it shows that there exists a sharp peak just right before the fluidization point. So it, this, uh, this large fluctuations are actually indicator of this yielding transition. With this, I'm going to summarize the main points that we have, uh, uh, I have talked on. So we talked about this yield stress materials that they yield beyond a critical threshold. And this uh, fluidation process depends upon the preparation history and their material origin. And yielding is basically comes with the large scale rheological fluctuations, which are mostly non-Gaussian in nature. And that non-Gaussian fluctuation uh, dilates the, 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 the percolating backbone, which, uh, which leads to further the which leads to the complete fluidation. With this, I'm going to stop. So much for the wonderful talk. Any questions from audience? No questions. Okay, let us think. Uh, yeah. I mean, I could have asked you later, but yeah. Uh, what? what which, how? How exactly do you get negentropy? What? Yeah. So this is basically, for example. Uh, we are given any distribution, some P of X. So what we compute are the nearest Gaussians. So nearest Gaussians are the Gaussian corresponding with the same first and second moment of the given distribution. And now we look at the distance between them, statistical distance between them. You can, the, the kind of measure earlier we used was the relative entropy between these two distributions, some P, G, with some given distribution P, X, and it's, nearest Gaussian, some PGX. And later on, we actually generalize it as a generalized distance uh, because there are some issues with the relative entropy that they are not symmetric. We have gone for a symmetric measure in, in this case. So in this case, uh, uh, so there is one more paper is following up where we make use of the generalized uh, distance function. But this one uh, also, uh, this one talks about the relative entropy based distance. Let us thank Suman again for the wonderful. I talk. think there is a question. Yeah, Jitendra. Uh, not a I mean, meaningful question, but yeah. uh, I was wondering, are these uh, region of high velocities mm. correlated in space or they are? Yeah, for example, if you see, for, uh, so this is the sample that is undergoing the failure. Now, this is a small region where, which I'm zooming here. So now this, these values are basically, when it is green, it means they are within the zeroth moment. And when it is three, it means beyond three sigma. So when a green region turns blue, it means that those are the extreme velocities. 
So those are beyond three sigma because for a given Gaussian, you have some ratios like 0.11%, which we expect for a Gaussian process. Now here, for example, when you see this accumulation here, when it goes here, you see that large accumulation of these blue points are there. So they are specially correlated. We didn't compute the correlation, but you can see that they, they exist uh, specially correlated. Okay. Thank you so much for the talk.